Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to We Are the Story, a visual response to racism. And my name is Carl Reichert, and I'm executive director of Textile Center, a national center for fiber art based here in Minneapolis. Next week will mark the first anniversary of the day George Floyd was murdered by a police officer in our city, a tragedy that sparked a national protest movement. Within a week of Mr. Floyd's death, curator Carolyn Maslumi mapped out a plan for a series of quilt exhibitions and events to speak to issues of racism and police brutality. Textile Center was honored to join Dr. Maslumi, Women of Color Quilters Network, and friends to bring her curatorial vision to reality. Today, we celebrate the publication of a new book that catalogs quilts presented in two juried and four solo exhibitions in Minneapolis during the past nine months. We Are the Story, a visual response to racism by Carolyn Maslumi is available for sale in Textile Center's shop and on our website, textilecentermn.org. This book was a collaborative effort with the Women of Color Quilters Network and Friends and Textile Center. And on behalf of Textile Center and our Minnesota community, we offer our gratitude to Carolyn and to all of the artists for this important gift to our community. The impact of this work will serve generations to come. As this book was being assembled these past few months, Textile Center committed to raising funds to cover design and printing costs. Tonight, we thank the Rosemary and David Good Family Foundation, the Minnesota State Arts Board, and more than 75 individual donors who contributed generously to Textile Center to support this important project. We also thank all of you who have purchased this beautiful book. We also wanna thank our exhibition partners who have been part of We Are the Story in Minnesota, the American Swedish Institute, the Weissman Art Museum, the Minneapolis Institute of Art, Lanesboro Arts and Plymouth Congregational Church. And most importantly, we thank the artists, all of them who have shared their powerful quilts with us here in Minnesota and virtually with the world. And it's been an honor for us at Textile Center to present your quilts in the We Are the Story exhibitions. During the Zoom presentation, you're welcome to use the chat if you have questions. We ask that you keep yourself muted during the presentation. And if you, um, and we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of this presentation. And now it's my pleasure to introduce We Are the Story curator and founder of Women of Color Quilters Network, Dr. Carolyn Maslumi. Thank you, Carl. Uh, first of all, I'm glad uh, so many of you could come here today to join me and the artist as we talk about the quilts and the show and uh, actually celebrate the artists that are in this show. I want to thank the Textile Center and Carl and the uh, Textile Center Board and all the exhibiting partners that um, displayed the quilts. And I would like to say a special thank you to Mr. Mark Dunn, the president of Moda Fabrics, who when I first uh, talked about this idea was one of the first people to come and to support it, not only in deeds, but financially as well. And this undertaking would not have gotten its jump start without Mark's Dunn, uh, Mark Dunn's support. So I would like to thank him for that. And I also want to thank E Quilter for their support as well. As an artist, I strongly believe that art has the capacity to touch the spirit and to engage and educate and he uh, heal in ways that words could never do. Um, the role for me, uh, I see the role of the arts in shaping the consciousness of human beings and act also as agents of change. And throughout history, art has been used as an accessible tool for communication and raising awareness about social issues and hoping that the, this will affect positive change and bring about a conversation. And that's the beauty of using quilts um, to talk about very difficult subjects. 
everybody's familiar with quilts and I find it's a very soft place to land and talk about difficult, very difficult conversations. So the series of exhibitions were uh, curated exactly for that, to bring about a conversation and to let artists bring out their feelings about racism and po uh, police brutality in hopes that all of this will affect a change. And judging from the people that have seen the show and the comments that, are, that have been left and comments that have been sent to me, I, I, think, I think the show has been effective in doing just that. I was amazed when I put out the call for the jury shows, hundreds of, pe hundreds of artists answered, but what struck me was the fact that so many people from outside of the country applied to be in the show. This is a testament to the effect George Floyd's murder had not only uh, to people here in the country, but around the world. It was a clarion call, a wake up call uh, to address issues of injustice against people of color. So this, this has really been um, a rewarding, a very rewarding project and one that is to me very close and dear to my heart. And um, I again want to thank the artists who have really put their soul into the work that they created for this exhibition. And it truly shows um, each piece, each piece um, is a serious cultural document that is indicative of the times that we live in, um, infused by the spirit of the maker of each piece. So today we're going to share, I'm going to share some of the pieces in the uh, exhibition. And we have most of the artists whose work is being pictured, it's a limited amount, but they are here and they will tell you a little bit about their work. And I want to especially welcome uh, Deanna Tyson, who's with us from London and one of the artists in the show. So I'm glad to see that you're in, um, in this Zoom talk and, and we welcome you. May I have the first slide? Uh, Carol Staples, are you here? Yes, I'm okay. here. Uh, yeah, so my name is Carol Staples and I'm from um, uh, Westchester, Ohio. Um, so I made a shield to defeat racism because um, I see a shield as a means of protection and uh, we needed at this time, during the pan pandemic, during all these um, police killings, the brutality, um, we have to come together like an army and we have to, this is my feelings, to get this to stop. It's systemic, it's a big thing. You need a big army of people gathering together to defeat racism. I know it's kind of plain and simple, but, you know, that's where we're at. We have to band together. We have to all come together as a human race. And we must defeat racism, stop the systemic racism, stop the police brutality, stop the oppression of Black and brown people. Um, so this, sim this shield symbolizes all of that for me. It may be simple, but it's beautiful, and the story behind it is quite powerful. Your message is powerful. Thank, Thank you, you. Next. 
Michelle Flamer. Are you are you here, Michelle? Yes, I had to unmute myself. Sorry. I'm Michelle Flamer. I'm from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This uh, quilt is called Dear White People, and it's really a letter. It was a letter that I started to my church, and I decided rather than writing the letter, I would make a quilt. We had a discussion one day after church about the protests that were going on, and one of our local churches had a Black Lives Matter sign um, in, on their lawn that had been uh, vandalized. So I said to our church members who were on the call at the time, I said, well, why don't we just put up our own Black Lives Matter uh, sign on our huge lawn in solidarity with the other church? Well, that uh, received a very kind of uh, unpleasant response. Everything from Michelle, all lives matter. What do you mean Black Lives Matter? But all lives matter. Don't you agree with that? And, and you know, there were charges of the fact that Oh, well, white people are also killed by the police. And I, you know, I countered with, yeah, but we're two and a half times more likely black people to be killed by police. So the quilt kind of speaks for itself. It's called Black Lives Matter. I challenged them. I said, your, your sons and daughters are marching with black people in the streets. They certainly understand that black lives matter. It's very important. I used a crazy quilt style. So all each of the letters are pieced. Uh, through a crazy quilt with hand embroidery. Um, it's a type of um, quilt that's better seen in person. So I hope at some point, maybe you'll have an opportunity to actually look at the detail on the quilt because I have the name of some of the, um, I'll call them martyrs for justice, like George Floyd and Trayvon Martin. Thank you, Michelle. Next. Mimi? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, greetings from St. Paul, my home, and also Sitka, Alaska is home. Um, this quilt depicts the Lafayette Park fence in Washington, D.C. when the fences were put up to restrict and stop the demonstrations for Black Life Matters. And like we always do when we're rising up for justice, we stay creative and focused. And instead of stopping the demonstrations, this fence became a gallery that continued to speak the difficult truths that America is being called to look at and deal with. And I love using um, quilt blocks that are, so the fence behind it is all crazy quilted as a reminder how crazy this systemic racism is. And you can't make these things up. The sidewalk, the square is actually called Crooked Courthouse Steps. And children as young as four on up to elders in their 80s gathered around a studio to go in the parking lot where I live. And the back of the cars became studios and sitting on quilts down by the Mississippi River also became a studio. And intentionally the signs really do talk about the ongoing work of a variety of racial justice movements. So I wanna give great thanks for the opportunity to participate in this show. Thank you, thank you, it's a wonderful piece. Aura Clay. Hi everyone, my name is Aura Clay and I live in Oakland, California. My quote is counting time from years, months, weeks, minutes. And for George Floyd, we're counting down to seconds. Time from 1619, when the first ship arrived in what is now the United States of America, bringing people from Africa and making them slaves. Counting time by the number of years to the 400 year anniversary which the 1619 project brought to our attention during 2019. How many months make up for those 400 plus years now? How many weeks, how many days, how many hours, how many minutes? And now how many minutes and seconds was a knee placed on George Floyd's neck until he died? Eight minutes and 46 seconds. We're still counting and still saying, I can't breathe. You can imagine the conditions on those ships crossing the ocean carrying human beings, 
and them crying out in the bottom of those ships saying, I can't breathe. On my quilt, I included a list of some of the people of color who have died at the hands of the police. By the time I printed a list and before I finished the quilt, I heard of another black man being shot by the police. Sadly, it seems that the list, the list is never complete because we're still counting. The title of my quilt is, and still counting. Thanks, Carolyn. Thank you, Aurora. Maud? Or um, I made this piece. Oh, I'm supposed to tell you my name. I'm Maud Hager, and I'm from Westchester, Ohio, also at this point. Um, and I, I made this piece because Ashton and she said, would you, would you join with us? And I was so pleased um, to, to be asked, and um, I'm honored to be asked to be in this exhibition and with all of you, too. Um, when I started, I, I made the people, and I um, um, just felt like I, when I put them against the piece, I, you couldn't see the people. And so I looked around the studio and found the gold, and I thought, perfect. Because in my home, we have icons, and they are, you know, I grew up thinking, you know, icons were about saints and, and a, a religious painting. Um, and I, I felt like they, this represented the, what a saint would be, which is that they would have, give, they do give of their lives. They do try to do good things. And so I felt like that that kind of joined together nicely. And it also brought just regular people up to another level, which was of saintliness. And I wanted to do that as well. Um, I, I teach in a high school that here in um, Cincinnati. And next year I get to work with them as a fiber arts teacher. And I'm hoping we get to take the kids to see this ex exhibit in Cincinnati. Um, another one of my friends found this thing called social justice standards. And I was, we're going to be doing these with the kids. And I, I felt like this was apropos. The last action standard says, I will join with diverse people to plan and carry out collective action against exclusion, prejudice, and discrimination. And we will be thoughtful and creative in our actions in order to achieve our goals. And I feel like Dr. Maslumi was incredibly creative. Thank you, Maud. Dorothy. Hi, my name is Dorothy Birch, and I am from Chicago. And this quilt is called 16 Shots and a Cover Up. And it is about uh, a young man who was 17 years old by the name of Laquan McDonald, who was killed by the Chicago police in 2014. So the police were called because uh, someone reported that there was a youth breaking into cars at a Burger King. And within uh, two minutes of the officers arriving on the scene, he was shot 16 times uh, by the police officer. He was also, the police officer had to be stopped from reloading his uh, gun and continuing to shoot him. So this particular quilt is of my great nephew and I pulled the autopsy report of Laquan McDonald and put in this quilt the 16 places where he was shot. So uh, he was shot in the head, he was shot uh, in the chest, he was shot in the neck, the back, arms and legs. And so there is a hole with a red glass bead that represents every place that he was shot. 16 shots in a cover up is what we were chanting when we were protesting, asking to get justice for Laquan McDonald. The person who killed him uh, was originally 
uh, charged after 15 months. That's how long it took for the police to release the video of what happened. And after that, the police officer was charged. He was convicted and he was sentenced to six and a half years. And they estimate that he will serve three years. So this is my um, protest quilt where I'm hoping to raise awareness about police misconduct in Chicago. Thank you, Dorothy. This is an extremely powerful piece and a very sad story. Bobby? I'm Bobby Nolan. I live in tiny Eagle Lake, Texas. And um, my piece is titled Flyover Five, Chains Broke Shame. In 2018, my sister and I visited the National Memorial for Peace and Justice in Montgomery, Alabama. And we were shattered. Uh, no one leaves the memorial without tears, no matter whatever their race. I had not realized the extent of lynching in America. I found that there was lynching in the county where I was born in Minnesota, in Duluth. There was lynching in Albuquerque where I was a five-year-old. There was lynching in Ohio where I lived for many years. There was lynching, the last lynching in the county where I live now was in 1935 of two 15 year old boys. I'm a white woman. I've never owned a slave. I don't know if any of my ancestors have ever owned a slave. I've never been at a lynching, but I've seen the pictures. There is just nothing that can be said except that this is our national shame. That's it. Okay. Thank you. Carol. Hi, my name is Carolyn Crump. I'm from Houston, Texas. And the name of my quilt is Crack Justice. And as I was laying on the couch, listening to the different videos of what was going on at that time with George Floyd, I started to get really depressed behind it. And all I could think about is growing up in Detroit with all the racial tensions in the 60s. And I thought it was crack justice then. And, you know, I said, we live in it. This is a broken system, a system that needs to be fixed. And I, I try to add all nationalities in this quilt of people protesting and people uh, looting and stealing because Everybody make it seem like it's only black people, but it is all nationality that still and that was protesting against uh, the racism that happened to George Floyd. So in this quilt, I wanted to uh, do all different kind of techniques that I really never had tried on a quilt before. So that's why I silk screen, I did um, heat tr uh, uh, transfers for the, the newspaper prints out of freezer paper and I want to use different types of dyes that I have never tried before. So uh, I just want to thank Dr. Ms. Looney because she always pushes me to uh, bring out what's inside of me and always tell me you have a story to be told you need you need to use your voice. So I thank her for always letting me use my voice. Thank you Carolyn. Next. Sharon, are you there? I am. I am Sharon Carey Harlan from Milwaukee, Wisconsin and Hollywood, Florida. Um, in 1965, a nonviolent march for African-American voting rights in Selma, Alabama led to the brutal beating of many peaceful demonstrators by state troopers. This day in history has become known as Bloody Sunday, which is the title of my quilt. Eventually, due to the persistence of civil rights leaders like U.S. Congressman John Lewis, African-Americans were granted the right to vote. 
These leaders knew that choices made at the polls affect you, your community, and members of your family. However, the voting rights struggle did not end in the 1960s. In 2021, we have leaders like Stacey Abrams and other activists who are still fighting for our voter rights because there are politicians who want to suppress the uh, voting rights of African-Americans. In order for our voices to be heard, we need to vote in every local, state, and national election, uh, no matter what obstacles are put in front of us. We cannot let the turmoil and the anguish that was suffered by our ancestors go unacknowledged. We have to know, and we do know, especially based on uh, what happened in 2020 election, that every vote does count. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Mm -hmm. Betty? Good afternoon. My name is Betty Lee Craft of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, my book is titled Nation Time 2020, Power and Protection from Racial Terrorism. I will read from my statement. Nation Time 2020 is a highly symbolic quilt calling attention to recent lynchings of people of color within two weeks after the murder of George Floyd. These violent acts are still mostly unresolved issues. All of us should be concerned that a reintroduced law banning lynchings in the United States at the federal level is currently being held up once again. My narrative has purposely eliminated swinging bodies from trees. It focuses on culturally encoded use of color, symbols, body parts, splattered letters, and stitched trauma lines, not shown here because the picture was taken before that happened. Eyes and fingers are metaphors that speak of past and present victims of lynching who are peering and pointing at their perpetrators, their enablers, and all those who were silent in the past and those who are silent now. The colors, red, black, and green of the Pan-African flag represent solidarity among people of African descent in North America and also in a global context. A collection of protective objects of mine inspired the stylized hand of Fatima and the raised black power fist, which symbolizes resistance and also solidarity. Ghanaian Adenkra symbols are centered within the hand and at the wrist area of the fist. The open hand symbol represents a fence, a fence that would surround a home, offering safety to all within its walls. The raised fist is a fence reference as in links of a chain, referencing unity and strength within a group of people working toward the collective good. And I would like to end with a quote from the late freedom fighter in South Africa, Stephen Biko, which says, the most powerful weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. Thank you, Dr. Maslumi, and thank you, Textile Center. Thank you, Betty. Sylvia? Hi there. Um, uh, this, my name is Sylvia Hernandez. I'm from Brooklyn, New York. Sorry about that. I don't know why the video is not coming up, but I'm here. <laughs> anyway, this quilt was put together as um, an homage to mothers and sons. Um, when George Floyd called his, his mama, when he was laying dying, it made me want to create something with my own son. So the illustrations you see here were done by my son, Miguel. And then um, I put the whole thing together. And, and then this quote by Malcolm X was, uh, I thought, very appropriate for the time. So, um, and on top of all of this, this quote was uh, 
was purchased by Spike Lee. So it's in his private collection now. So I think that's pretty cool as well. And it all came from the one article in the New York Times that uh, thanks to Carolyn and the textile center uh, came out. So this is just my way of making a statement for mothers and sons everywhere and the connections that we have. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Sylvia. Hi, Jeanette. My, thank you. My name is Jeanette Floyd and I am from Lake Forest, California. You may be wondering why this piece is in the exhibit, so I would like to explain. My piece was entered into a very large quilt show and conference here in the West. And as an artist, I stood by the piece at times and could hear comments regarding the artwork as people were unaware I made the piece. As I was listening to women of color comment about this artwork, I would hear comments such as, it is a beautiful piece, love the use of colors black and white, or he is a good looking man. And the main comment I heard the most was, I love his locks. Women who were not of color, I would hear comments such as, I don't like the subject matter. Why is this in the show? His hair is ugly. I don't care for it. His hair is not neat. And other comments worse than these that do not bear repeating. Now, let me add here, not all responded this way, but enough did to startle me. As I heard these negative comments, I became deflated, sad, angry, then resolute. I was literally hearing racist remarks about this artwork. For this very reason, I submitted this for the exhibition, We Are the Story, a visual response to racism. It amazes me that this piece consists of nothing but fabric and thread, and it received these types of comments. Unfortunately, racism and bias is even in the quilting world. I hope one day that racism will no longer be anywhere in the world, but until then, we will persist. I would like to thank Dr. Maslumi, Textile Center, and others for the chance to exhibit this piece. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jeanette. Thank you. Marjorie? Is Marjorie Diggs here? Okay. Um, Marjorie Diggs evidently isn't on, but her piece addresses the difference in how um, people are treated sometimes by the police. For us as African-Americans, and I, I think about this always that, you know, the police shoot to kill if it's a black person. And as opposed to shooting to stop an individual without killing them, there's a difference. There's a difference. So hence the title of Marjorie's work, Different Targets. Why? Why is there a difference? Next. Edgenetta Miller. Hello everyone, this is Edgenetta Miller and I'm from Hartford, Connecticut. My quilt, I have lived with racism all my life. And this is very true. And I think for all of us women of color, we have lived with it. Uh, looking back on my life, I am surprised that I'm alive today. I have a very volatile temperament sometimes. Uh, and when I have been stopped by the police for absolutely simple reasons, for instance, driving to a wedding and they're telling us, my daughter and I, that we're driving too fast and pulled us over and gave us a fun $500 ticket or going in a grocery store and having someone follow me or going to a store in New York and having someone walk behind me and I turn around and I will say, are you following me? And they would look at me and they say, of course not. But it was, wasn't true, they were. They label you all the time. 
we are facing racism in all aspects of our life, whether it is police discrimination, poor medical care, or just simply trying to breathe. I am at a point where I am just about sick of it. I have become such a staunch advocate for justice, justice in all of our lives. I did this quilt in red and black and white, red for the blood that we have shed, black for my people and white for all the racism that I have felt in my life. I will continue on with the struggle. The failed and corrupt response to racism in America is not the exception, it is the norm. And believe me, Ed Janetta will continue on fighting. I believe that we all need justice and all of us need to unite together to make this happen. Thank you, Dr. Maslumi for adding my quilt. Thank you, Textile Museum for um, having the nerve to put it up because this is a wonderful exhibition and a lot of people would not have chosen to show this. All praises to all my quilting sisters. Let us keep on struggling. Let kept not struggling, but let's go forth with the struggle and unite and keep our hopes alive. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Cynthia Lockhart. Cynthia. I think I'm, number one, I'm overwhelmed by what has been said already. And so I hope I can get through this. <clears throat> um, Cynthia from Cincinnati. My title is Enough is Enough. Stop the killing uh, throughout America and the world. And I will read my statement. Throughout America and the world, we have seen a veil lifted to expose the stain of hatred that exists against Black people in America. If there was ever any uncertainty regarding racial injustice in America, it, is, it was clearly revealed for all to see. Black men, women, and children have been victims of atrocities since Black slaves first arrived in America in 1619. For Black people in America, it has not been a land of milk and honey. Millions of Black people have been victimized and killed just because the color of their skin. America will not continue to prosper until it recognizes that Black lives matter and makes atonement for its wrongdoing. Black people have contributed to make America what it is today by providing free labor, bloodshed, sweat, tears, creativity, major inventions, medical cures, most of which we never received acknowledgement for. Black people were simply denied the privileges that white people enjoy on a daily basis. Just imagine what our history would have been if white America had not had its knee on our neck for centuries, despite all the adversity that was put in our pathway. Still we rise by the grace of God, enough is enough, stop the killing. The quilt is composed of mixed media, collage, silk screen, dyed fabrics, applique, hand paintings. The eye represents the revealing and eyes wide open and uncovering of all the dehumanization and appalling treatment of black men and women and children had to endure in this country for 402 years. The beating and stones represent the light that we follow. As you see the multiple faces that you see, they're all multicolored. These are representing past victims. And George Floyd is the one that has a ray coming from his eye over on the left side of the screen with a beam, he's looking up to heaven. But the eye sees everything that's happening. Thank you so much, Dr. Maslumi. Thank you so much, Textile Center. And thank you so much, artists. It's overwhelming. Thank you, Cynthia. Eileen? Yes, I'm here, thank you. And Thank you, Dr. Maslumi, the Textile Center, the artists and the audience who are all part of making this a, a successful show. I'm Eileen Dowdy. I live in Northern Virginia near Washington, DC, but my quilt is based on events in Seattle, Washington. I have family members there and one told me 
almost a year ago now about going to a protest and seeing a woman standing in front of the police line open an umbrella and the police grabbed her and took her away. Now, you know it rains in Seattle. There are umbrellas in Seattle. This is, this is just insane. A, a week or so after that event, I saw in the news a photograph taken of a woman, I presume a woman, wearing a gas mask again, walking near a police line and they were shooting tear gas at her. And the, what to me was incredible was this woman seemed to be dancing. She was not terrorized by it. She was so self-contained. Her umbrella was open, a beautiful umbrella open out to the side. And her, her pose was like a dancer. And that is what inspired what I'm depicting in this quilt. You can see in the upper right, a rigid police line in battle gear. On the left is the, the protesters in various poses, including hands up, don't shoot. I can't breathe. There are open spaces filled with outlines of other people representing those who could not be in the in the protests um there's social distancing going on people could not be in crowds myself included wanted to be in these protests but could not go but this is the outlines are representing all of us who who participate in this movement so across the diagonal is the figure of a person moving across gracefully as that terrible tear gas for no reason is aimed at the crowd. Like some of the speakers, the artists before me, it's not over, this is ongoing, it's so systemic. And now not only we have protests, but we are hearing our lawmakers contemplating new laws, making it practically a felony to protest. So it's not over and we have to keep, we have to keep at this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Beverly? Good afternoon. I am Beverly Huggins Kirk and my dad would tell stories lest we forget. So my quilt is a personal journey. I grab every opportunity to tell the story of my aunt, Ada Lois Sipiel Fisher. And it's my grandmother's story and my mother's story as well. My grandmother, big mama and dad Sipiel, 100 years ago, had their home and church in Tulsa and on May 31st, 1921, they were burned out of the Tulsa race riot coming to the town that we lived in Chickasha. The Sipuel legacy is one of Christian faith, equality, and education. Lest we forget, the backstory is 1896, the year that the United States Supreme Court handed down a decision in the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, and that was legalized segregation in schools where black students were less in the quality of education to be received than their white counterpart school system. Even in higher ed, white Oklahoma colleges could refuse enrollment due to one's race. The NAACP sought to overturn this ruling and such a victory was won. It was on January 8, 1948, above my Auntie Fisher's name, that uh, Attorney Thurgood Marshall finished his presentation and the ruling was handed down that struck down segregated education. The 1948 Sipuel Legacy Quilt further set the stage for the historic 1954 Brown versus Board of Education decision. We lived in a deeply segregated Oklahoma. 
vicious community, boomer sumers in the quilt. Oklahoma University denied Ada her application to attend the OU School of Law. They set up a scam school and it was later closed. And when admitted, Lois had to sit in the back of the room in a circle with chains around her chair. The white students removed the chain and welcomed the new students. So civil rights prevailed as I found words for civil rights. Dr. Fisher later inspired me and hundreds of students as she taught sociology at Langston University, Oklahoma's only HBCU. Today, my daughter and granddaughters, again, lest we forget, they see racism at its, at its worst. And it is in the face of racism that we resist. When Ada was asked why she would give up three years in a court battle, she simply said, two roads diverged in a wood and I, I took the one less traveled by and that has made all the difference. We all can make a difference and we're committed. Thank you for this opportunity to speak. Thank you. Deborah. <clears throat> Greetings to you all and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Deborah A. Moore Harris. I'm originally from Detroit, Michigan, but now reside with my husband, Daryl, in Holotus, Texas, which is located just outside of San Antonio, Texas. My quilt, American Legacy, is a reflection of America, past and present. The death of Mr. Floyd caused me to research, to look for names and events resulting in unjust deaths. The names and events are stitched on the Constitution, which is often used by many to justify racist behavior. The red, white, and blue is the advertisement of America, portraying that we are all equal. The black reflection of America shows we are not. The black reflex represents those that were tortured, brutalized, or murdered without cause or justification by an unequal, unjust, racist system. The red is a reflection of legacy, American legacy, which is the blood spilled by Black Americans long before Tulsa, Oklahoma, yet continues today. Thank you, Dr. Maslumi, Textile Center, and thank you everyone, friends, family, and quilters for your support and for your expression of America today. Thank you, Deborah. Next. Oh, that, that was the last one, Carl. That was the last one. Thank you. Okay, I'd just like to say a few words. Um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, uh, art serves as a reflection of our society and the times that we live in. And artists have used, as these artists have, their unique and compelling uh, vantage point to make powerful statements on social justice issues of today. It does not matter in this instance with this group of artists, what color you are, uh, the story, the story is compelling. We as African-Americans have lived, I, I often uh, define myself as an African-American woman born in the Jim Crow segregated South. We lived this American story. A good example though, someone outside of the culture coming from a unique and compelling vantage point Bobby Nolan's quilt and the inspiration behind that quilt. Um, we are all gathered together in this exhibition with that one commonality to address these inequities and wrongdoings against people of color, in particularly African-Americans. It 
Social justice art uh, aims to raise critical consciousness and build community and motivate individuals uh, to promote change. It's also a means to record history and shape our culture and harness individual and social transformation. It can not only be used as a means to generate awareness, but it can also be used as a catalyst to engage the community members to take action, to take action around a social issue. In this case, police brutality and racism. And I, I love so much what I do. And I love working with quilts. And it's something very special about putting needle to thread, using simple cloth to extract these very powerful stories. And I defy anyone to come and look at these quilts and not be affected. The stories told today were very powerful. And again, I thank the artist. I thank you. You've just done such tremendous, created such tremendous, uh, powerful, powerful pieces that uh, have not only affected our spirits, but just cut to our soul. So thank you. Thank you very much. I would also at this time invite questions from the audience. If anyone has any questions at this time, if you have them, please, by all means, put them in your, your questions in the chat room and we'll be happy to answer them. So Carl, do we have any? Um, well, there, I, yeah, there is a question. Where does the exhibition go next? The exhibition will open uh, July 2nd in Cincinnati at the um, Underground National Underground Railroad Freedom Center. And it will be there, I believe, through September. And then after that, it will go to Florida to uh, Sanibel, Florida, to Big Arts Center. Any other questions? Another question was, was every quilter an artist before they started quilting? Well, I'll open that up to any of the artists that want to answer that. <laughs> Artist, you want to? Anyone I can just want say to answer I'm that not, question? I'm I'm certainly not an artist, and I'm um, well, I make quilts. Let's put it that way. But I'm a full time lawyer, so there you go. <laughs> but I have a sewing machine, a lot of fabric, and many thoughts about a lot of things. <laughs> I think you'll find people here, artists here from all walks of life. Right. I. Uh, I only know a few of us that are trained artists, mm -hmm. but we all came from other, other avenues right. to get to the artwork. Right. <laughs> Any other artist want to, uh, wants to address that issue? Uh, this is Donette Cooper. Um, are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. And um, I think we are all we are all artists, no matter what other fields we come from. Um, the, the the quilt is an artistic expression. Um, I came from the fields of education and law. I'm a practicing attorney. And Gwen Samuels has her hand raised. I uh, stopped uh, sewing. Excuse me. Am I here? I stopped sewing when I had children for 20 years to raise them. And then it was time to, for me to say, what would I like to do? And so surprised to learn that I can quilt and I can make some colors happen. So I keep trying. 
Gwen? Hi, yes. Um, my piece wasn't shown because I, I registered or asked you too late, but in any case, I wanted to say that I was sewing since I was five and I didn't start quilting until uh, many years later. And it was quilting that got me into other arts, you know, um, poetry and uh, other fiber arts. And so quilting was the inspiration for me to have more artistic expression in other areas. Thank you. I think Donette, I Cooper, her, her, Donette Cooper has her hand raised. Sorry, I spoke already. Oh, you did, I'm sorry, okay. I can um, add to that, I'm Jeanette Floyd. And I, I guess I've, I've, I've always worked with my hands since I was little, like knitting, crocheting, making little art figures. So I wasn't a formal artist, I guess you could say I didn't get a degree, but this, uh, even this, I fell into it because of um, someone asking me to, they called it a blanket. <laughs> And so uh, I just kind of fell into this and, and um, I guess about four or five years. So I'm fairly new to it, but I am here today. Thank you. You have a comment. I'm on mute. I'm unmuted, Cynthia. Um, I, I was not a formal artist. I had a fashion design background. But I, I believe that artists are called, called from above, from God. And um, I believe that being able to tell you a story, communicate a story and uh, create imagery through quilting and um, in whatever form or shape you do it, whether you're a traditional quilter or uh, you paint, do um, uh, mixed media, what have you, is a, is a, is a part of the landscape. Of, of art. Quilting is an art. And um, again, fashion design background, never thought that I would uh, would be making quilts and what have you, because I did, you know, garments and what have you. But this was, this is the best thing that ever happened to me. And um, I'm again, so thankful for being a part of the show. I'm Jackie Dukes. And I don't know if my quilt or not, because I have some issues. But I learned to quilt in Japan, and I love being able to share our stories. And for me, it's a venue that allows to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other there questions? Any uh, Dorothy Birch had her hand raised. I, I just want to say when we talked about quilting that I am an educator I don't know what you're doing, but you're taught for two human rights and social justice. And, and I use the quilts to teach about human rights issues, but I also use them when I was doing protesting. And so uh, doing another protest is how I really got into quilting. My quilts would have been in my basement had it not been for Dr. Carolyn Maslumi, who really mentored me and helped me become a quilter. So I thank you so much, Dr. Maslumi. You, you're quite welcome. We're, we're enjoying the fruits of that labor. <laughs> with your wonderful quilts. Thank you. Uh, Linda Black has her hand raised. Hi, thank you. There are a lot of questions in the chat, um, but let me just, I'll ask my question. Um, I'm curious about the American Legacy um, quilt. Um, partic all of the quilts are just amazing. I'm completely blown away, but I was curious about the technique on the American Legacy quilt. I missed some of the commentary about it. I'm yes, I'm particularly interested in, um, well, just if you could just tell me some more about the technique, that would be just um, wonderful. Thank you. So uh, Maddie, is Deborah Moore Harris available in the auditorium? Yes, yes, I am. Oh, and thank you, yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, the American Legacy, actually, I'm a fiber artist. 
um, who quilts um, periodically, if you will. Um, that technique is basically free motion quilting. Uh, I literally found the names and stitched e every name and every event along with the year of, of the events into the quilt. Uh, the technique for American Legacy was basically from a class that I took on paper on how to manipulate paper uh, from another fiber artist. And that was translated into fabric. So each word was mirrored uh, through the fabric and then uh, stitched into place. And like I said, the quilting was free motion quilting through the entire piece. So it is, it is in effect your traditional quilt where you've got a top, your batting and your back. But um, it's just all fabric and thread telling the story of, of us, of America. Thank you, I'm amazed. And what's on the bottom? That's my last question. I can see like five, um, I, I, but I can't see what, tell what they are. When the bottom of the quilt, they're like, oh, she's gone. She's walking away. <laughs> <There's five. laughs> well, go ahead, what's your question? On the bottom, there's like five, I can't tell what they are. It's like five um, um, images on the bottom or something sewn in the bottom of the quilt. They're like, yeah, those are tombstones and crosses. I couldn't tell what it was. Thank you yes. so much. I want to see this in person. Thank you very, very much. <laughs> Thank you. So, oh. I have a question. I, I have, this is Bobby Nolan. Um, I have a question. About, <laughs> okay. Sorry, about what's going on. How many of the quilts are going on tour to Cincinnati and Florida? And I, I wanted to make a comment about the artist thing. I um, only recently had the courage to call myself an artist. Before that, I was a nurse and a, an attorney and an administrator and uh, a quilter. But now I'm an artist and, and making this quilt has made me a stronger advocate for things that I believe in. And I think from now on, those are gonna be my quilts. Someone asked, um how many of the quilts are going to travel? And that will be 45 quilts. And it was a very difficult um, job to select those quilts. This exhibition is too large. It's much, much too large to travel the entire exhibit because there are few museums large enough with galleries large enough to hold the entire show. So, um, we only have a small portion of those quilts traveling. So I'm happy with that. On, on that note that we do have the uh, book that has all of the quilts in it from all, uh, all exhibitions, well, six of the exhibitions. And um, the We Who Believe in Freedom show has its own separate catalog. So all of the quilts are documented. Unfortunately, all of them can't travel. It's, it's just, it was just too many. I have a question. Yes. Um, it's an extraordinary exhibit and it's one which I would love to see again and again, which leads me to ask two questions. Uh, what's the possibility of this exhibit coming to New York City? And secondly, since I would love to share this evening with others who I think would enjoy it, is there any way to access this um, um, again? Um, Carl could answer the question about accessing this talk. Um, I, I don't know about that. Insofar as uh, the show coming to New York, I... <laughs> I'm always looking for venues. So two, I have to throw this back out. If someone has a recommendation for us to send information about this exhibition to a certain institution, please feel free to contact me. And this uh, presentation is being recorded and <clears throat> it'll be posted on, on our YouTube channel and there'll be direct links to this on our webpage 
textilecentermn.org slash we are the story. So it should be up probably within five days or so. Um, we have to give our staff a little time to put it together, but it will be on the archive, that archive, and that'll be available to you moving forward. We have um, Ms. Abelman with a question, hand raised. Is it Ine? Yes, it is Ine. Hi, I'm honored to be part of the show. Um, as far as quilting goes, I came to quilting um, after I had uh, my first child and uh, joined a group at um, a sewing circle. And those women, um, 38 years, we still quilt together every once in a while. And so for me, quilting um, was part of me uh, being part of a women's circle and being able to, you know, stitching away, all sorts of talk happens and all sorts of um, support occurs. So um, that was integral to me. Um, many years after I decided to go back to uh, school and I wanted to get my master's in art and I brought quilts with me and it was sort of like, you know, I was, it was kind of giggle um, back then. But then I found Faith Ringgold and um, I found I found women that um, were telling a story with a quilt. And um, ever since then, that's been um, a format that I use in my work, whether it's with fabric or not, whether it's digitally, I do digital imagery quilts, but always the format of the square and the grid has followed me. So quilting has really um, been a, 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 a source of healing for me and a source of camaraderie for me as well, as well as now in this case, um, helping to be a representative and um, an advocate for women that have been um, lost through murder and through uh, police brutality. So it's, it's had a lineage in my life that I so honor and, and I'm so thrilled to be part of it. And thank you so much for this show and thank you for allowing me to be part of it as well. I'm glad that you mentioned the camaraderie mm -hmm. uh, because to me, that's an equally important part of uh, quilting. And I think about the Women of Color Quilters Network in particular, because they've been like a family. They are my family. Mm -hmm. And um, my children look at them as family because many of them I've known for almost 40 years. So <laughs> they are truly, truly like my sisters. Yep. Um, and I cannot imagine them not being in my life. So right. I enjoy, I enjoy uh, working, very exactly. much working with them. Mm. Well, Lisa Rice has her hand up. Yes. Lisa. Hi, thank you. Um, Dr. Maslumi, uh, this has been very impressive and um, I couldn't keep up with all the comments I wanted to write. Um, I really appreciate um, that you, you brought this together. I live in Washington, DC. And so of course I'm going, we've got to have this exhibit here in DC. We've got to have it in DC. Are you um, in the works with any venues here to- I have contacted all the appropriate venues and they all said no. Oh, well. <laughs> so, sorry. Maybe we can get it in a surround area surrounding the yeah. city. Yeah. Um, yeah. I Look, I have made some things happen. Sometimes I'm like a dog on a bone. So <laughs> I, I'm going to do all I can to see if we can um, get it you know, and I'll be in touch with you because it's very, very important. And, um, you know, I, I mean, this is just incredible. Uh, thank you thank so much. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Dr. Meslumi, oh. someone asked what, if you had to put all the quilts in one area, what size would you need? Oh, for the for the entire the show, entire, yeah, that I, was I would have coming. to calculate that. I, I I I don't know. I can only answer for the um, quilts that have been the, the forty two quilts or so that have been separated out for travel. 
that requires 12 to 1500 running feet. And I would have to calculate what it would be for the entire exhibition, but it would require a lot of space. So if you email me privately tomorrow, I'll have an answer for you. Thomasina has her hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, I just want to uh, take the opportunity to uh, publicly thank you, uh, Carolyn, for the opportunity that you've given us to uh, express ourselves and our feelings through these quilts. And uh, thank you for being there for uh, all the artists for all of these years. And Textile Center, um, I would like to thank you guys as well for the opportunity to uh, show our work in Minneapolis. Thank you very much. Thank you. Christina? I, you have to unmute yourself, Christina. I'm going to raise my hand. Okay. 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 Thank you. As one of the artists, Dr. Maslumi, I too would just like to thank you for the opportunity and the Textile Center for allowing us to use our voices through quilts to tell the stories of, that have so hurt our hearts sometimes because my quilt was a very difficult quilt. It's the only quilt I've ever made when I was enraged about an issue. So I just want to thank you for allowing us to be able to use our voices in the way that we were able to. Well, I, I thank the artists. I'm, I'm grateful to all of you for making these quilts and contributing them to the show. And I know it was not, it was not an easy task because the mm -hmm. turnaround time for the, for the making of the quilts and the presenting of the quilts was like a nanosecond. And so I'm amazed, <laughs> I'm amazed at, at the work that we got because there really was not a lot of time uh, given to make the quilt. So again, we're very grateful, uh, the Textile Center and myself that we have these quilts because um, there was not a, a lot of time to make them. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Susie Ryan has her hand up. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Susie Ryan from Worcester, Massachusetts, and I'm one of the artists that's in the exhibit. And I just want to say thank you so much to Carolyn Maslumi, to Carl Reichert, and to the Textile Center, and for all the other artists that just, your work has all blown me away. And it's just amazing, like Dr. Carolyn Maslumi said, that people sent their pieces in in such a short time, but that's because the issue of the problem still exists. And so keep working, keep showing, keep making your quilts. And thank you again for the opportunity to exhibit and tell our stories. They were indeed passion fueled. And, and that's, that's one of the things that drive artists to create and uh, uh, make use of our time. If we're, the more passionate we are about a subject, you know, we can, we can get things done quickly. Uh, Beverly? Yes, please. Hi again. Uh, I appreciated your comment about Moda as a fabric company being supportive. I wouldn't have quite known it, or I often wonder, and maybe it's the Oklahoma climate, but I search and I'm enthusiastic when I can see colors and fabric that reflect something that African Americans want to use, or I'll question, am I just feeding into an economy that does not help the black community or you know those type of questions. So gently, I was glad for you to hear, hear you say that. And um, yeah, that's good, I'm great. We all love you for the ways that you can be proactive when we feel like, I wonder, I wonder, I just don't know. And I'm going to bring this up to Mark Dunn. I think that's, that's an important valid issue. So, We'll see what happens. Thank you. So Rachel Clark has her hand raised. 
Uh, yes. Uh, I was watching this. I came on and the work is so incredible. And what I really want to thank people for, not only just the incredible work and the work and effort that Carolyn puts into these shows, but how people can give voice to issues that I think we all understand, but sometimes can't say it in a way that that other people can access it. And so that was the thing that I am most touched by uh, in the quilts in this show is how the artists picked a topic, whether it was immediate George Floyd or whether they moved back through history, but they connected what the systematic problem is in this country, and that is racism. And I just want to tell them all how much I appreciate what they did, what the, their work, and the message that they sent. And I hope more people will get have an opportunity to see the show. And if they don't have an opportunity to see the show, we'll take an opportunity to access the YouTube uh, presentation later on. So I will definitely be posting it on my page and encouraging people to go and see it because I just think it's absolutely marvelous. And so kudos to all of you all involved, including Carl. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sylvia Hernandez has her hand raised. Hi again, everybody. But I think my our, our takeaway should be that these stories have to be told. If we don't tell these stories of what's happening now for future, they will be forgotten and swept under the rug. So it's important to tell the stories in whichever way we see it in our way. And then people will see other things in the pieces that we create as, as part of, of the whole. And it's fascinating to see how from one thing, so many different pieces of art can come, depending on how people are seeing it and how they're feeling. It. So, so it's super important to, to tell our stories. I tell everybody, and even with your family, tell the stories of your ancestors, tell your stories, because this is the only way they will live on and they will not be forgotten. We have to say their names so they can remain in the present and not just fade away. And thanks again for letting me be part of this. I, that's one of, for me, one of the purposes of creating art to record history, to shape culture. And uh, as I said earlier, quilts are like cultural documents. Hundreds of years from now, people will be looking at these quilts, getting a glimpse into our country at the time and what was happening in our communities and families. So they're no less, these quilts are no less than historic documents. So Michelle Bishop has her hand raised. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Maslomi, as always, a phenomenal job. Congratulations to all the sisters in quilts for giving this project life. I have two questions. How do you all heal when you have uh, such heavy topics that you're creating with? Um, and then also, is there a curriculum that is formulated that can be shared with school systems about the subject matters? I can I'll answer the question about the curriculum. Uh, with each exhibition I've ever done, there's been a curriculum for uh, elementary and secondary students. Um, so we're working on this for this, the travel of this exhibition as well. So if you write me, um, I, I will let you know about that and I, I will forward it to you. Thank you. But we always have, that's an, an very important component of traveling um, any exhibition, not just the documentation of the work, but also having a program there, an educational component that teachers can use in the classroom to talk about uh, um, the themes surrounding the shows that we've been showing for the past 40 years. So 
if you contact me, I will send you that information. I will. Thank you. So LaToya Thompson has her hand raised and maybe some folks here will be answering your question, Michelle. We'll see. Latoya. Hello, um, I was driving. Um, I would just like to say, I really appreciate all the work that you all have, I'm sorry, that you all have done. This show is so emotional. And um, I am a teacher and the person who just spoke took my question. <laughs> And um, I'm a quilter as well. And just looking at all the quilts and the subject matter, and this is stuff that I have been teaching my students about. Um, I just, just want to say thank you. Thank you for bringing this out. Thank you for sharing your gifts to everyone. And that's it. Thank you. I'm just full right now. I, I, I can understand because the, uh, the work is truly emotionally overwhelming. And somebody asked, how do you heal from this? I can only answer for myself because there, there are certain pieces I've been working on surrounding this topic. And for myself, there's no healing. The only satisfaction I get, you know, I get from creating the work. But at some point you get overwhelmed doing the same kind of work over and over again, the same subject matter. Like I've been working on a piece now for six years and I can't finish it. It's called Hands Up, Don't Shoot. And it's a huge piece. It's like maybe 20 feet and it's a flag. And, and I, I love to play off the American flag, but on this flag, there are victims of police shootings. And every time I think I'm finished, my list keeps growing and not just one or two victims, but really growing. Um, it's, it's, it's really incredible. I'm here at my desk and I always keep a notepad with a list of uh, people shot by the police, African-Americans. This is my list for the last eight months or so. So they, I want to add these people to my quilt. So prop that, you know, it's just, that piece is just ongoing and it's, it's really, it's overwhelming and sad sometimes, but I, I just feel compelled to keep, keep going. So I don't know when that sadness will end. I'm 75 now. I don't, I don't, I don't see any end at, to this story. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't see any changes on the horizon. If anything matters, uh, affairs for us as people of color, as African-Americans living here have become worst. Mm -hmm. uh, they really become worst. I, I just, purchased several months ago, a quilt called the Green Book. And it's about mm -hmm. the Green Book. And I'm thinking, gee, that was a book that we used back in the 50s and 60s during segregation. So we would know what hotels we could stay in, where we could eat or get gas and whatnot. And now I'm thinking, geez, maybe it's time to bring it back because especially now, I don't necessarily feel safe traveling, driving long distances. I don't, I really don't. So things have gone backwards, I feel. So we have someone wants to make a comment in our auditorium at Texel Center, so Maddie. 
Hello, um, my name is Edith Gross, and I'd like to first thank you all so much for uh, putting on this exhibit. Uh, I thank the Textile Center and Dr. Maslumi. Um, I'd like to share something with you about my piece and uh, about putting this together. One of the things that happened as I was working is I was looking at all of the media stories and feeling like I, I can't do a lot about what's going on. But I saw our young people out and they were out in large numbers. And I, to, in my opinion, they were doing the right thing. But I understood that in times past, I probably would have been out there with them. But because of my age and all involved, I couldn't be there. My quilt gave me voice and it gave me an opportunity to unite with them. So in my own way, in my way of thinking is, I wanted to show that I was supporting what they were doing. And I'd still like for them to know that we are supporting them. So I think with the group of people that we have here and the diversity that we have, the voices that we have, I would just love for everyone here to, um, to share this, um, the, the video with them, share your books with them, sh share the quilts, so that we all understand that we are united in this effort. And so I'd like to thank you all, thank the lovely um, quilters, uh, the artists, the work is phenomenal. Thank you. I see that uh, Deanna Tyson has her hand up. Hi, um, I'm, I'm really rather useless with uh, technology, but my, um, what I'm wondering is whether part of the problem of getting um, exhibition space is not just the, the fact that you are women of colour, but that you women. And is it... Um, is it time to, to kind of do a, a faith ringgold and actually campaign, even if it's an exhibition of protest quilts against the fact that it's so still so incredibly difficult as women to get work into art galleries and particularly stitched work. It might be a nice idea for a new exhibition. That question, though, has many, many little branches to it. Um, in the 40 years I've been doing this, it's true. Women do have a difficult time getting into museums. And fiber work is at the bottom of the totem pole when it comes to museums accepting work for exhibitions. So for us, we have... we. We have many obstacles as African-American women and then the topics that we have exhibited over the past 40 years mostly deal, have always dealt with, with the exception of one, uh, African-American culture, some, some facet of racism, some facet of, of uh, Black history here in this country. And, that in itself is hard to place. So, uh, but I keep plugging away at it. You you never know. So Gwen Samuels. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Gwen Samuels, you had a comment? Uh, yes, I wanted to say first that to Dr. Maslumi about it's a story that's never ending. I think it's important for all of us as quilters and artists to keep telling the story and perhaps this exhibit could, you know, be done again in a, a year or some similar call, you know, to invite others so that there's a comes a point in time where just like everyone knows about the AIDS quilt, they'll also know about the We Are the Story quilt. And I don't know how that could be done, Doctor, you're you're phenomenal in doing that, but it's just a thought. And I wanted to say about the healing part of it. 
as well. I'm in Albuquerque, New Mexico right now. And I feel a little bit safer than I did when I was back East. The murders that really affected me were Amadou Diallo and Trayvon Martin. And I had been wanting to do a quilt like this since um, Trayvon Martin was murdered. But then so many more murders happened that I was just completely overwhelmed. And I feel like that this um, is a part of things that compromise our health and our immune system. And at the time that uh, Breonna Taylor was killed and Ahmaud Arbery, I believe it was, I was actually in the hospital here. I had contracted COVID. I was in the hospital for 23 days and on a ventilator for 10 days, eight of which I was in a coma. And I made it through, miraculously, I made it through. Um, I think COVID has a lot to do with, you know, us getting COVID has a lot to do with our immune system being compromised because of the trauma that we've historically faced as black people in this country. And, but I made it through, I made it through. And when I came out of the hospital, um, I decided that I wanted to make, you know, this, this quilt. It was not long after that, that George Floyd was murdered. And a friend sent me this information about the exhibit. And I said, I got to do this. I got to do this. This is the time now. All the way back from when Amadou and Trayvon were killed, this idea had been in my mind. And I finally said, you know, this is now the time. And it was so healing. I was literally circling my dining room table with my oxygen hose and, and concentrator in tow, making this quilt. And it was so it was so healing for me in terms of my recovery from COVID and being able to bring some of that anguish outside of me. So yes, it, it, it is a healing process. The healing is not complete and it will never be complete until justice is won, but it's a step you know, towards, towards healing. And thank you, Dr. Maslumi, and thank you to the Textile Center. I so appreciate having been a part of this because I still consider myself a novice and I, I was just so thrilled to be able to be a part of it. And I'm in tears now, so I'm going to stop talking. I, 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 <clears throat> I must say, stay tuned because we have another exhibition coming towards the end of the year about COVID. Oh, um, yeah. I got a, I received a grant from the NEA for that project and it's because African Americans were so well disproportionately affected by the pandemic. In fact, we lost 18 uh, network members over a year and a half period. Oh, so uh, we will be addressing that issue in the form of a quilt show. And this quilt show will not travel. I do plan on doing catalog, but it will be up on our website. So you can look for that in, in the oncoming months. Carolyn, I just, this is Mark Dunn. I just wanted to say thank you for taking a torch on this project and making it happen. It's, it was a tremendous undertaking and thanks to the Textile Center who chipped in and, and made the decision to put this exhibit on. It's just, um, I was just glad to be a part of it. I just, it's just, and so pleased to see how many people have participated and, and gave of their art and their talent and their time to uh, make this exhibit a success. Well, Mark, again, I, 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 I thank you and, and Moda for your uh, sponsorship. Really, it, it meant a lot. Um, I have to say, over the 40, almost 40 years that um, the Women of Color Network has existed, we've only ever received um, two grants. And everything that we've done over the 40 years financially has fallen on the shoulders of one or two people. So to have... Um, to know that you believed in what we did, what we did with this project, and not only in words, but your financial help meant a lot. Thank you. 
Sylvia Hernandez has her hand raised. Hi, I, I know I wanted to speak on the healing after creating these projects. Um, I think it's uh, like a sense of, of going through the stages of mourning. And so you, you struggle to create the piece, create it with some kind of beauty in, in, instead of showing the ugliness of it, just to give it a little more humanity. And it's, there's lots of crying, lots of praying, and lots of just, you know, asking for the, the higher powers to help you create something that, that says what you want to say that people will understand. I think it's important when you look at a piece, if, if you get some of it, just seeing the images that I try to put on them, at least in my pieces, it's important to give that first impression. But there's definitely lots of, like I said, lots of crying. And and if if it's for someone that's deceased, you always, you know, at least I do. I, I ask them for, for their help and their presence to create this piece, again, with respect and with and with honor. So at least that's the way why I approach uh, my artwork. Thank you. Thank you. Our time is up for this session. I want to again thank the artist. And, and <laughs> thank you. I find it always amazing the work that comes from needle and thread, the power, the power of putting needle and thread and cloth together to make these pieces that are so uh, complex in story and so emotional that really, really touch the spirits of everybody that see them. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Maslumi, for your curatorial vision and for the way you just rally these amazing artists around this exhibit. And again, it was a real privilege for us at Textile Center to work with Women of Color Quilters Network and friends and you. You made it all happen and we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. So Thank we, will, we will have this posted on YouTube in the very near future, and we will let you know as soon as it's up. We'll try to send out an email alert uh, through our newsletter. And again, um, uh, thank you all, and um, thank you for... Um, just everything you've done. And we will keep the archive up for all the activities and recordings and such on our website. And uh, so with that, I think we'll say good night. Good night, all. Good night, everyone.